Good afternoon. I'd like to welcome everybody once again to our Ponca Politics Forum. And today we're very fortunate to have our K County elected officials here. Uh, we're going to do a, a type of a forum format and such. And what we're going to do is, is one at a time, each one of the four officials here today will get up and they'll give us an update. Uh, I saw earlier a little preview. I think there's a slideshow as well with some pictures. So we're thrilled about that. And then if time allows, we'll entertain questions from the audience. So uh, what I'd like to do, go ahead and, and introduce our four. We have Christy Kennedy, our treasurer, Tammy Reese, our county clerk, Jason Shanks, District K County 2, newly, fairly newly elected, and then K County District Attorney Brian Hermanson. And I don't know how that order was determined, but anyway, Christy, you get to go first. So please welcome <laughs> Christy Kennedy, K County Treasurer. Thank you, Lee, and thank you to the Punk City Chamber for inviting us here today, and thank you all for coming out on this beautiful, sunshiny, I keep having to remind myself, it is winter time. Is this the, okay. What I'm going to start out with is a little history of the K County Courthouse. Hey, I, got, I figured it out. At the time of Oklahoma's land run in 1889, county lines were not designated. Uh, Territorial Governor George Steele laid out the counties uh, designated as first, second, and so on through the sixth county. Counties resulting from other land openings were given letters of the alphabet. K County was formed from the Cherokee Strip or the Cherokee Outlet. Uh, K County is the only county to keep its same name as the Oklahoma area moved from a territory to a state. So I guess, I don't know, we just weren't imaginative. I don't, if it was just, just a good name, you know, it's worked great for us. So. But you added I had what? You added a yes, that's, yes, yes, we did. The first courthouse and jail was built in 1894 at a cost of $3,605. That courthouse burned down March 1, 1897. Quoting newspapers of the time, outlaws set fire to the courthouse just after midnight. The building and all records were destroyed. Two days prior, there had been several indictments against bankers, and several outlaws were also under indictment at the time. And you know the bankers really appreciated that newspaper, including them in that, in that <laughs> sentence. You know. The second courthouse was built in 1897 at a cost of $3,000 plus a cost of furnishings of $1,000 and was paid for by the insurance proceeds from the fire. This courthouse served K County until 1926 when the current structure was built. K County dedicated the new courthouse on October 28, 1926 for a cost of $291,999 with approximately 8,000 people in attendance. It was designed by Clyde Woodruff and built by D.C. Bass and Sons. A mill levy had been passed on August 1st, 1922 to pay for the new courthouse and the building was fully paid for when it was built. 88 years in our historic courthouse is still beautiful and going strong. The next subject um, that I'm going to talk about is always an extremely popular subject. Tax collections. And just a little, little caveat, uh, the tax statements did go out today, so y'all can look forward to, <laughs> to that in your mailbox just in time for the holidays. What I'd like to immediately point out is that the vast majorities of these collections go to our school system. As you can see now, I've used the mill allocations for the city of Ponca City for this year. And as you see, uh, between the schools and the Pioneer Technology Center, over 82% of our collections will go directly uh, to, our, to our schools. A little over 10 mills is always for county uh, general to, to run the county. Uh, our county health uh, department gets uh, approximately 2%. And now, since this is the millage allocation for the city of Ponca City, which uh, is the, 
in the city limits. There's also a city sinking included. Um, this is the only one at this time that we are collecting, and it's a, we will collect about 622000 for the city of Ponca City, and we simply collect that through taxes and we send it on to, uh, to Ponca City. Um, one thing the county also does, if, if the city um, needs help in collecting a mowing lien or demolition, something of that nature, they can certify that to the county um, that will be that will create a lien against the property and when that um, particular lien is paid then that money is sent directly to to the city our total abstract this year will be right under 36 million uh, 25 approximately 25 million of that will be collected from the Ponca City city and rural area with uh, six and a half million of that going to the schools and that does not include the four million that will uh, go to the Pioneer Tech from this area. Uh, legislatively, the one thing that um, the county treasurers are, are looking into, we have had an issue uh, with um, properties that have at least four years uh, of taxes due against them by statute we must uh, sell through our June resale. Um, the Oklahoma Housing, uh, excuse me, Oklahoma Health Care Authority um, can place a lien on a property uh, that is not removed by that sale. We have had counties in the state that um, one, one in particular has a piece of property that's worth about $5,000, but it has a $200,000 lien against it. Well, this is an issue because that means that the county will never be able to, to sell that property. Um, last year, we um, were able to get legislation passed that it would at least allow us to negotiate with the Oklahoma uh, Health Care Authority. Um, that's had mixed results. This year we're looking at, and this is in the very early stages, but we are looking at um, legislation that would make it uh, possible in extreme situations for the counties to simply say, when it has an Oklahoma Health Care Authority lien, no thank you, we do not wish to acquire this property. Uh, the way the legislation is written right now, that would stay in the owner's name and that that has many issues connected with it so again that's in the early stages but that is a problem that we are uh, trying to accomplish okay Chris, we appreciate the update I'm sure we'll all appreciate the early Christmas gift that you mailed it, but one question, is re-gifting out of the, is that, I guess not. <laughs> all right, next we'd like to introduce Tammy Reese, our K County Clerk, your turn, Tammy. Welcome. Having a little trouble with the clicker. <laughs> well, thank you, Lee, and thank you, Ponca City Chamber, for inviting us here today and the city of Ponca City for the use of this beautiful room and for all of those that are in attendance and took out time to be here. I hope you enjoyed Christie's presentation of the history of the courthouse um, as much as I did. I thought it was great, but it's always good to be able to talk about things that you're passionate about, and of course, that is county government. And today I'm just going to give you a brief overview of history of county government and some of the county government functions. One of the greatest gifts that our country derived from old British civil law was that of county government. The basic principle of local people representing and solving local problems created local county government. Prior to 1907, the state of Oklahoma reviewed 46 other states' constitutions before writing our own. The Constitution designated powers to local county government with full knowledge of local governing. Mm -hmm. 
Oklahoma counties are extensions of state government and are primarily administrative bodies which possess executive and judicial powers, but not legislative powers. Our primary responsibilities are related to managing, planning, and governing unincorporated land within our borders. County government keeps records of marriages, divorces, property ownership, and court activities within the county. We must also maintain a court system, law enforcement, road and bridge construction, and voter registration. As extensions of state government, county government is responsible for six major services. Maintaining the peace and protecting life and property, assessing and collecting taxes to fund public schools and operate the county, compile, record, and preserve public records essential to maintaining individual property rights, building and maintaining public roads, highways, and bridges, providing facilities for courts and the administration of justice through the district court system, and caring for the needy and indigent. Each county government is composed of eight elected officials and a district attorney, each serving four-year terms. The constitutional offices are three county commissioners, county clerk, county sheriff, county treasurer, and court clerk. The statutory offices are the county assessor, county excise equalization board, county board of tax roll corrections, and the Oklahoma Cooperative Extension Service. The authorized offices are civil emergency management. And I might add that this is the only authorized office that K County has but other counties uh, might have libraries, hospitals, and fire departments as well. Okay. 176 people are employed by Kay County. This number does not include the OSU Extension Office or the District Attorney's Office, judges, or parts of the court system that the county helps fund. Some of the county government funding sources include ad valorem tax dollars, fees such as motor vehicle, visual inspection and county clerk, county sales and use taxes, state and federal motor fuels and vehicle taxes that are used for road and bridge maintenance and construction, and gross production tax on oil and natural gas. Legislatively speaking, uh, there is consideration to change legislation on, on the font and margin requirements um, for, on documents that are presented for filing in the county clerk's office. Okay. Thank you, Tammy. What I'd like to do this time is welcome K County District Commissioner Jason Shanks, and in about another couple of months, you're going to be the old man in the in the group, aren't you? <laughs> we have two new ones coming in. Jason Shanks. Thank you. I want to thank Lee and the Chamber for having us here in the city, and thank these three people for keeping me in line. So, uh, first off, I just want to say. Uh, couple projects we're working on we have a a uh, the BIA they help K County out quite a bit and uh, I have one project going or fixing to be going with uh, with the BIA and uh, the other two districts they each have one also so thank them for helping us out uh, on this All right, we have in Kay County on the road and bridge side, we have 67 structurally deficient bridges. And I know everybody has heard the term structurally deficient in the newspaper or the media and it kind of scares everybody, but it's really not as bad as what it seems. 
Uh, the structurally deficient, it just means that the condition of the bridge includes a significant defect, which often means that the speed or the weight limit must be put on a bridge to ensure safety. And uh, just going back to the to the speed, it could be on a curve. So if a, if a bridge is close to a curve, a bridge could be perfectly fine and still be structurally deficient. Or if it's uh, the weight limits, you don't put a weight limit on a bridge in Oklahoma unless it's under 23 tons. So if it's 22 tons, it's still, and I mean, it can be in really good shape also. So if you hear that term, don't let it scare you too bad. Uh, or a structural evaluation of four or lower qualifies a bridge as structurally deficient. Uh, the designation can also apply if the approach is flood regularly. So that's, there's several avenues there. Uh, then another bridge, and I didn't have the, the total on the functionally obsolete, but that's another term that goes along with the functionally deficient. And it just means that the, they're just out of date, more or less. They're, they're just not designed for today's standards loads. Uh, K County has 268 total bridges, and we have 1,454 total miles that we maintain. So. Here's a map, I don't know how well you can see it, but the purple routes are the major collectors, the major routes, K County. The yellow are minor collectors. And then the, just the little gray routes are just your regular roads so on the major collectors it's more of the production get your goods to town the, I mean the major roads so uh, our funding a lot of people think our funding comes from ad valorem tax and we do not get any ad valorem tax for funding of roads and bridges uh, ours is uh, from they're all state taxes diesel fuel uh, motor vehicle fees, uh, fuel taxes, and a big one's gross production tax. So, uh, we have other areas of funding as the tribal, which I mentioned a while ago through the BIA and the CRR, CIRB and the STP funds are also available through the state. And then we have uh, funds that go directly to the county. The state oversees those projects and uh, we have the CBRI that uh, work the county commissioners are control over. This is just a breakdown of our funding. It's, looks like our biggest one is the motor vehicle fees and gross production, gasoline tax. That's what I have. So. Thank you. Brian, certainly, last but not least, <laughs> welcome. Please welcome District Attorney Brian Hermanson. Hi. You all know me. Um, they told me that we all had 15 minutes, but any amount that they didn't use up, I got. So uh, I've got 40 minutes of, of time. Um, uh, they warned me that it wouldn't take all that time. And I, as you know, give a lawyer 40 minutes, you'll take 60. So. Uh, uh, Bear with me, and I, I, hopefully we'll have some time for questions and answers for anyone that has any questions they may want to ask. I'm a little different than, than uh, Tammy and Christy and Jason in that I'm not a county official. I'm a state official. Um, we're, we're all, the, <laughs> and Tammy likes to say we think we're hot stuff because we're state officials, but we don't. We're, we're, and, and amazingly, in that most county officials work together well with each other. We are very close. Um, we talk on a regular basis. Um, um, and obviously uh, have to rely on each other a lot. We are very blessed. The three county officials you just saw, we are very blessed to have them. All our county officials, we are thankful for, for all the work that they do uh, and the things they have to do. Um, tell you a little bit about the DA's office, maybe tell you more than you want to know, but hopefully it's, you'll find it interesting. Um, we are an office that has 23 employees in both Kay and Noble County. Our budget's about $1.5 million a year. Uh, for all the stuff that we do, um, and if you go to the bottoms button, down, if I go to this, th that is a uh, breakdown of where our monies come from. Um, you can see that we receive about half of our monies from the state of Oklahoma. 
Uh, we feel we should be fully funded by the state of Oklahoma, but the state of Oklahoma has other places they want to put their money, so they give us opportunities of, of raising money or receiving money through what we do. Um, we do every we get money from all different types of things. We collect bogus checks for businesses, and there's fees related to that, not to the business, but to the offender. Uh, we have DA uh, 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 DA supervision where offenders have to do certain things, and we supervise them accomplishing the goals that they have to accomplish in, during a suspended or deferred sentence, and they have to pay for that. There are all different types of things, and that that is a breakdown of exactly um, where our monies come from. Um, the uh, and we have a budget. Every year we have so much money, we know we have this much money to work with and we have to work within that budget. Um, we have to pay for all our own computers, our, our uh, uh, desks, chairs, salaries, everything we do we have to pay from those monies. Uh, some of the money comes from the county, a relatively small amount. <coughs> I think it's 40 some thousand dollars uh, for the office, and plus they have, they have been kind enough to give us $50,000 this year and last year. Uh, for our uh, drug task force to help fund our drug task force um, and then Noble County has given us 25,000 for that drug task force also so that helps us we have when I came into office uh, we had five ADA's assistant district attorneys along with myself in Newkirk um, the one of those off one of those ADA's left just before I got there and so we operated with four ADA's and myself for uh, until just last June, July, and then we added a half-time person. Um, one of our ADAs from Perry comes up half-time here and half-time in Perry, and in Perry we have uh, that half-time person plus a full-time person and two uh, uh, paralegal secretarial type people. Um, the type, the, our ADAs are, all have uh, respons certain responsibilities. We don't, some district attorney's office, they just separate the cases as they come in, we separate them by class so that they can become an expert, expert in the areas that they're dealing with. Um, I, my first assistant is David Wilkie. David's been my first assistant for the last two and a half years. Um, and he handles all our drug cases except for trafficking and manufacturing, which I handle. Um, the, uh, we have the ADAs that handle other things. Things, type of crimes we cover, and again, we cover the wide gamut, but we handle sex crimes, uh, deprived, delinquent, Juveniles, uh, child abuse, DUIs, property crimes, ID theft, embezzlement, traffic, domestic abuse, and everything else you can think of. Um, we a break. We have a breakdown of of the type of cases that we handle. Um, and I, what we did is we've taken um, and seeing I can't read that, and I'm not going to turn around so you don't hear me. Um, I'll look at my phone for a second. We uh, we have taken the several years from uh, to look at what type of caseload they had in years prior so you can see how perhaps things have changed in Kay County. Uh, back in 1989, which is 25 years ago, uh, you'll see that they had relatively a small amount of misdemeanors and small amount of felonies and they, they've more than doubled in the last 25 years. Uh, but traffic offenses were almost where we are now. We have about a thousand more traffic tickets than we had uh, back in 25 years ago. But you also see in the last, last last 10 years that misdemeanors have gone down somewhat. Some of that may be related to um, the city of Fox City taking some of those misdemeanor cases, uh, some, some DUIs, some uh, other misdemeanor cases the city of Fox City uh, prosecutes in municipal court. Uh, and, but our felonies have gone up uh, rather significantly and we attribute that mostly to drugs, um, drug cases. Um, we have taken uh, s certain emphases in our, our uh, office um, and I say these are emphasis, they, everything is fact driven in our office. We look at the facts of the case and try to determine what is the appropriate resolution uh, in the case. How a typical case comes to us is the chief, de the chief, the police departments or other agencies that report to us. And we have all sorts of agencies that report to us. All the cities in, in Kay County that have law enforcement send us cases. The sheriff's office sends can cases to us. The highway patrol will send cases to us. We'll get cases from the OBN, which is the Oklahoma Bureau of Narcotics. We'll get them from the OSBI. We may get cases from uh, the ABLE Commission or, or perhaps even DEQ or um, other, agents, other state agencies that have investigators. So it's, sometimes I'm surprised I'll see a case come across my desk that we haven't seen before and find out there's another agency providing us cases. But uh, 
Um, we, you know, that's our job. Our job is to be the prosecutor. Sometimes they'll send up a special prosecutor to handle some case that they have a special interest in, and we'll help them with those type of cases. Um, we put, the, but we put special emphasis in, in several categories. One of those categories has been DUIs. Um, I became tired of seeing a number of people that are dying on our streets um, or people that are losing loved ones because of DUIs. And so we have now made it a, an emphasis that if someone is, has their second DUI, and not, not second conviction, but their second arrest for DUI, that they have, they have already had a wake-up call when they got arrested the first time, and this now it's time for a real wake-up call. And so we, on the second DUI, um, it may not be a felony because if it's, it was in municipal court, it's, it, we may not have the right to take that to a felony until some recent laws have just recently changed. So what we do is part of their requirements are that they have to do an ADSAC class, which is a, a DUI class. Uh, to, um, and they have to also do what's called a VIP class. And a VIP class, if you've never seen a VIP class, it's amazing. Um, it's where victims of DUIs come in and talk about how DUI has ruined their life, either because a loved one is, is, is uh, an alcoholic and cannot deal with, with drinking and driving or the loss of a loved ones. And try to give a wake up to the people that are drinking and driving to know what, what the true consequence of drinking and driving is. But because we really want these people to think about the drinking and driving, second offense, second arrest, you're going to spend four weekends in jail. Four, you're not going to lose your job, you're not going to lose your family, but you're going to spend four weekends sitting in jail thinking about drinking and driving. Um, and every one of those people that pleas, I, I say to them, next time you're going to prison. Because the next time it will be a felony, and the next time we are going to send you in jail for longer than four weekends, because we need you to wake up. And the, the times of ten years ago where someone has five DUIs and hadn't had a conviction yet are long gone in Kay County. We're taking a very aggressive tact toward that. We've gotten a lot of, of negative feedback from the defense bar about that, but they're, they're starting to come aboard. The judges are all aboard on it, and uh, I believe it's going to have a long-term effect to the positive where people are going to realize that this is not the way they want to spend their life. Another uh, uh, area that we've given emphasis is on uh, people that sell drugs or manufacture drugs. Um, the drug, drugs are a scourge of, of every city in the state of Oklahoma and the fact that we have a large drug presence in Kay County is nothing different than any other county. If any county tells you they don't have a drug problem, they're not telling you the truth. Um, meth is so cheap and easy to find these days. To give you an example, we, our drug task force, which we'll talk about a little bit more later, was involved in an investigation, I believe it was in the city of Blackwell, they were told wh where to go, they got confused and went to the wrong house and still bought meth. I mean, the fact that you can throw a rock and find a house where there's meth being sold is, is pretty uh, amazing, but that's just, that's just a sign of the times. And uh, we, we like to say that about 80% of the crimes in, in Kay County are because of drug, drug abuse, alcohol abuse, or um, uh, gambling addiction. Um, that they're all tied together and they, they create a huge amount of, of not only the DUIs and, and, but the embezzlements, the, uh, the false identity, identity theft, the, uh, the stealing of, of property, copper wire, things such as that. They all uh, apply together. Um, the, we've also seen, unfortunately, in the la la recent past, uh, an increase in violent crimes. I think that's, again, something that's statewide. You watch the evening news, first three, three news items will be someone shooting someone or someone stabbing someone or someone doing some sort of violence. We used to say every three or four years would have a homicide in Kay County and now um, I think this year we've had three um, and uh, uh, we're handling I think five or six in our office right now from, from, from throughout the county. And they're not, you know, people say well that's because of guns. They're not all shooting cases. Some are shooting, some are stabbing, some are, are hitting, one, was, one is we're hitting a person over the head with a pan. Uh, and, and uh, um, so it, 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 lots of different things give rise to it. Uh, again, many of those cases are there was alcohol involved in, in it. Some were just anger issues. A lot of people don't realize that we also have a civil side in the district attorney's office. We are the legal advisors for all the county offices. Um, if they have a question about anything, whether it be the court clerk, the county clerk, the treasurer, assessor, uh, election board, um, county commissioners, all of those people, come to us with legal questions and that happens on a regular basis. I sit in on the county commissioner's meetings every week that I'm in town, which is most weeks, 
um, that, I, that I will be there at their meetings trying to provide the legal advice, to any contracts that they sign. Uh, theoretically, I get them and get a chance to review them and, and look at them uh, before they are, they are passed. I try to let them know when, if they're violating the rules, if, if, they're, if I'm provided access to the information that they have available to them. Uh, likewise, we serve as advisor for any of the sub-agencies, uh, the fair board, things such as that. We try to provide them uh, any type of guidance they may. We don't go to everyone's meetings, um, but if the fair board, I, one time the fair board asked for me to attend and explain some things to them, and I went to that meeting and, and provided that information. It depends on when they wish for us to do it. Likewise, the excise board, uh, the board of tax adjustment, and things such as that, when they ask for us to attend, we attend and try to provide them any guidance. It, it's really, uh, fortunately, my background allows me to do a lot of that because I was a general practitioner when I was in the practice of law, and I did a lot of civil and criminal stuff. Most of my ADAs uh, have never dealt with criminal with civil stuff because they're dealing criminal stuff every day. So it worked out real well for me to take on that responsibility. We have a lot of, as I mentioned, 23 employees in my office. Um, we many of them would do things that you again don't relate to the district attorney's office. We have a victim witness coordinator. Uh, Jody Fraser, who's been with us for over 30 years, I think it's 33 years, and Jody's in charge of just being in touch with the witnesses, making sure they know where they're supposed to be, talking to the victims. Sh she'll be on the phone most of the day, all day long, lining up witnesses for the next day's trials, making sure the attorneys know what cases are coming up. We have a five-week tickler, tickler system where we start receiving information five weeks before a hearing that the, the, where, the, where the witnesses have been served and, and what, what, what the stack up for that day is going to be. Um, and she'll be basically, the, her job is to make sure we always take into consideration the victims. Um, sometimes in the helter-skelter of, of handling the caseload we have, uh, we don't have a chance to look up and uh, they'll say the family is in the, in the office and they would like to talk to you or the family is, uh, would, has some questions and need you to call them back. And we try to keep the families involved in that. We try to get them involved as much as we can in any settlement discussions that are happening by involved aware of what's going on and what's happening. Uh, especially in the major cases, we try to make sure they understand why we are recommending what we're recommending. Many times they're on board. Sometimes they don't like how, uh, how aggressive we are going to be with sentencing and want us to come back off of some recommendations. I tell them that that's not, you know, I, I want to hear what you want to say. I want to know what your thoughts are, um, but I'll have to make the call in the final analysis because um, some crimes we have were, uh, especially in domestic violence, uh, they may be uh, abusers, they may have gotten almost killed on Friday night, and on Monday they're at court with, their, with the person that was victimized them, uh, bonding them out and trying to ask, tell the court not to pursue charges. So we have to take into consideration all circumstances in trying to determine what's right. Uh, working with Jody and, uh, is our victim's advocate, which is Sarah Palmer. Uh, Sarah is, uh, um, her job is to be an advocate for the victims in the room. When, when we're talking about cases, when we're talking about um, filing charges and all, she uh, has been, in, again, in contact, constant contact with the victims and will try to make sure the victim's wishes are discussed at those times when the victims aren't there. She also has Tula with her. I Hopefully you've all met Tula. Tula is our courthouse dog. Tula's been with us for about a year now. And uh, uh, Tula's a joy. Tula is... Uh, Tra specially trained dog to be, that, to be a comfort dog for victims. Um, and um, we've had some great stories with Tula. One, one of the, my favorite stories is that we had a child, a five-year-old child come into the office with his grandma father who had been the victim of uh, abuse. And the father, grandfather said, uh, you're, you're not gonna be able to get him to talk about this at all because it's just, it's just too, too much for him to talk about. He came in and after a few minutes he was chasing Tula all over the office and having fun and it came time for serious talks and my ADA sat down with him and said, how are you doing? And he said, well, let me tell you what happened. And he just told the whole story without any, any problems. He felt comfortable, he felt safe, he felt that he was where he needed to be and just freed up uh, and did that. Tula has the ability to be able to actually go into the witness box with the witness and lay at, at the uh, witness's feet and put his head in her head in his, uh, his or her lap so the child can be petting the dog while testifying. Makes the child feel a little more in control, makes the child feel like maybe there's a protector there. Now Tula will not protect. Tula is uh, as unaggressive a dog as you're going to find, okay? A gun would go off in that courtroom and Tula, when, once given the command, will not move and will stay there for all day long if that's what it takes to be. Um, 
We don't have permission yet to use TULA in jury trials yet here, um, by at least in Judge, Di Judge Boyd's courtroom. Um, but I, we're, I think they're coming along, and hopefully as they see how inobtrusive uh, TULA is, that we'll be able to do that. An interesting story, Payne County had a case where they had a child that was, had been uh, molested, and they asked whether we could bring TULA down to help with that trial. We sent Sarah and TULA down to Payne County. The judge did allow TULA in the courtroom and lay in there, and the child expressed afterwards how much easier it was to testify this time than the time before because of the dog being there. So that's, that's one of our, Tula didn't cost us any money. Uh, it was a, a, a gift to us. It was about a, about a $30,000 dog that was given to us by a group that provides courthouse dogs to people. Um, and it was, uh, it's, it's a great success story that we, that we love to have. Um, the, uh, we also have what's called a restitution coordinator. We, are, we try to, whenever possible, if someone has had a loss, because of the crime against them, we try to get restitution established by the courts, and the courts are very willing to do restitution. So that restitution coordinator will follow up, make sure that the monies are paid as ordered by the court, and that when they're, when they're paid, that the money gets back to the uh, individual people. Unfortunately, the Supreme Court, this is kind of a, a sticking point with all the DAs in the state, the, the Supreme Court has ruled because of the budget problems that the restitution is one of the last things to be paid when funds are paid. Court costs are one of the first things because that funds the court system. Um, so it may be three, four, five years before a victim sees the, the restitution. And so it, it, many times they'll say, wow, I've forgotten all about that and it was great to receive a check in the mail. But it's, it's, we do about 100 to 120 checks a month to victims of crime, uh, re reimbursing them for a portion of, of what, what their loss was. We also have a bogus check coordinator. Again, I don't know how many businesses realize that we actively, aggressively go after people that write bogus checks. Uh, we write them letters trying to get them to pay the monies to the, uh, the different businesses, and if they don't reimburse them within a certain time frame, we'll actually file charges. If they are a frequent violator of the, op of the bogus check law, we will actually file charges and pursue it to uh, its logical conclusion. Um, but uh, we, have some, we are, again, write checks every month back to businesses who uh, who have been lost money through bogus checks and, and do that. We also have a DA supervision coordinator. She handles, uh, I think it's like 3,500 cases right now is her caseload. Um, we believe there needs to be a therapeutic side to any type of case we handle. So we try to always make sure that someone has to do something. In domestic violence cases, we try to get them into a 52 week uh, domestic violence program where they learn not to, to reoffend. In cases where, uh, as I mentioned, the VIPs and the and ad sacks for, for uh, drug, uh, alcohol cases, there's a thing called alcohol and drug evaluations for drug cases where they have to do that and follow certain requirements afterwards. There may be some therapy issues they have to do with anger management and, and such. So we have different things we try to do with different people and make them do. We also order community service for people to, again, we want to make it inconvenient to break the law and so that they have to uh, realize that if you, there is a, and perhaps an embarrassment, embarrassment factor that you're doing community service, but you need, it needs not to be convenient to break the law. Most of these programs cost them some money. Um, the legislature has seen fit rather than give us all the money we need to run our office that we get a portion of those monies back to, uh, to uh, pay for our office, um, and it pays a lot, a lot of it. If we didn't have those programs, we would lose, have to lose quite a few employees. We don't like it. We think it's kind of like the old Justice of the Peace thing where the Justice of the Peace would find you $500 and that paid for his, uh, his, uh, his salary. We don't like it, but that's, they will not, the legislature, legislature will not pay us our full um, money. So, and we've lost several hundred thousand dollars of our budget over the last year. So this is the way we've had to make it up thanks to the legislature providing that prov provision for us. We also have a, one person that's our financial person. Um, as you can imagine, we have a lot of payroll. We have a lot of things we have to buy on a regular basis uh, in our office, and, and uh, um, she's in charge of that, as well as being a paralegal for one of our ADAs. We have four paralegals in our office. We have a invest, full-time investigator. His job is to do all, of, all the investigation for our cases that law enforcement, uh, when, once law enforcement has finished, and I say that Law enforcement many times never finishes in investigating a case. They're always following up, trying to go find out additional things. But as we approach a trial, we may send our investigator out to try to find certain witnesses and try to get them served with subpoenas, try to get information 
for us in that regard. Plus, he serves as the uh, director in charge of the task force. The task force is out in the street on a regular basis. In fact, they're out probably out on the street right now. Um, I say right now, sometimes they work at night, sometimes they work in the day. Uh, they, they're very flexible in how they work to try and dealing with the patterns of drug trafficking in, in our, our state. They, sometimes they're on the interstate doing interdiction work. Sometimes they, um, a couple weeks ago, I just had breakfast yesterday with the chief of police in, in uh, Perry, Brian Thomas, and uh, he was telling me that recently they did an interdiction, they did a, uh, a, a presence where they come in with all the law enforcement officers they can gather and they go into towns like Morrison and Billings and Perry and Lucene and let every, you know, real quickly that spreads out that the task force was there and hopefully letting people know don't be too comfortable in our in our communities. Um, they're planning to do that again up here in Kay County in, in the very near future. Uh, and they, they made quite a few arrests during that, that uh, presence. Um, we also have a receptionist and a new case manager. We, we receive, on a Monday morning, it's not unusual for us to receive 10 or 15 new files at this, that morning, which we have to have ready for the court. We get them around 9.30 or 10.30 in the morning. We have to have them ready for initial appearances by one o'clock that day. Not ready to file it, because sometimes we need additional investigation, but ready to give the court a recommendation on bond and make sure that there's probable cause. You saw up there, uh, the, maybe it's still up there, no. Up there earlier, there was the 3,000 traffic tickets. One, someone in my office has to look at each one of those traffic tickets and make sure there's probable cause, the crime was committed, and that the right crime is on the ticket. So that's a lot of, lot of handling of a lot of paper that we do. When I was in private practice, I handled about 150 cases on, on a daily, on a yearly basis. Um, I, I considered that a lot. It was, I was very, very busy in the private practice of law. My lawyers handle, handle between three and 400 cases a year. So that's not including the traffic tickets. Um, the, uh, we get to pick which cases we file. Uh, we don't file every case that law enforcement gives us. Sometimes we'll look at it and we'll feel there's not probable cause for the stop on the street so we don't file it or the facts aren't there uh, and send it back and ask for additional information. Usually that's not a lot of cases. Law enforcement does a good job of preparing their, ca their cases. Uh, Chief Bohan needs to be congratulated for the police department he has, has operating here. We've got great officers, very well trained, very professional in what they do and we are very blessed to have them uh, working with us. Um, the we have drug court. You all are familiar with drug court. Drug court is a uh, program where people that have not their first drug offense, probably not their second drug offense, but they're, they're about to go to prison for a long time. Uh, if they don't have any violent crimes in their past, and if, if, if they've not been in drug court before, they're given an opportunity to plead, to waive their preliminary hearing, uh, plead guilty to the charge, and go into drug court. And if, if they're successful in drug court, which will take at least a year, more likely a year and a half or longer, if they're successful and complete all the counseling and the, and the different drug tests and, and all the different things they have to require, do and weekly meetings that they have to do for that period of time, they, were, they will then get a recommendation that will not include prison time. If they fail drug, drug court, they don't go back and have their trial, they are, they've already agreed that they're gonna spend it probably 10 years or more in prison on that offense. It takes some of the pressure off us. It gives them a second chance. We have a lot of people that are successful in drug court. Um, sometimes there's a, the success rate is real high in drug court, much higher than sending someone to prison. It saves us money. We don't send loved ones to prison where if another family has to get on food stamps. Um, uh, but there, you know, meth is a terrible thing. Cocaine is a ter terrible thing. There are sometimes relapses in people that don't make it all the way out. But we, when, I, when I was elected, we added DUIs to um, drug court. They have been very, very successful. Probably the, the people that respond best to drug court are people that are alcoholics or, or abusers of alcohol. Um, if you ever get a chance to go to a graduation in drug court, go. They read letters talking about how drug court has changed their lives. It will really make you feel good about the, how changes can happen in people's lives. Judge Boyd makes the comment that we are more social workers, both judges and DAs, uh, than, than most people are. And it, there's a lot of truth to that. We are trying to change a mindset. We're trying to change people from, be, from being uh, of a mindset of getting something for free or, or abusing someone else. The legislature the last few years has been encouraging us not to put people in jail except for the violent offenders. Um, 
we try to do that as best we can. It's not unusual for a, me to have someone before me that has eight former felonies. Um, that person is not going to not go to prison. I mean, there, there, we have to uh, send people to prison when they deserve it. And unfortunately, right now, if we send someone to prison for five years or less, they're going to get an ankle bracelet on their ankle at, after 90 days and will be sent on house arrest. Um, for nonviolent offenses that uh, they don't have a long history, that's probably fine um, because we can still, if they violate the law, there's certain things we can do to put them back in jail. But uh, the frequent offenders, um, there are, I've got a, 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 a sentencing this afternoon, an argued sentencing where the person is a frequent DUI, uh, and then when the police start pursuing him, he tries to elude the police officers. And twice, in two different cases, it went through a roadblock. Well, that person is going to go to prison for a while this time because he's ha had several chances previously. <coughs> and now it's time for him to realize he can't drive through the city streets of Fox City drunk at, a, at 90 miles an hour trying to elude a police officer and put all the citizens at risk. Um, we're almost out, we're out of time, so I'm gonna, cause I want to save some time for questions. But we also do a lot of other things besides work being in Newkirk. We are on different teams of uh, the Deering House. We're active with the Deering House with dealing with crimes against children, uh, with, with the uh, domestic violence of North Central Oklahoma. We're active with them in dealing with domestic violence. In case any of you don't know, domestic violence is, is probably one of the most seen cases we have up in, in our office. Uh, we have a docket just for domestic violence cases. Um, we put in a, a program about three years ago. <coughs> we were, the, I believe, the first one in the state to do it, where we, you know, about 50 or more percent of the cases were getting dismissed because, as I told you, the, uh, the victim was not wanting the defender to go to prison because that was their husband, their, their boyfriend, the person that was providing the rent for their, their house and all that. So we, we changed it so that we got them before the judge within, within two weeks. We made an offer to them that we, in most cases, depending on the circumstances, uh, they would not go to prison, uh, but that they would have to do the 52-week offender training and trying again to break that cycle. That has been very successful. Our, our, our success rate is very high in that. Um, and it's uh, been one that other, other counties are trying to copy from us, which we're gladly letting them do that. Finally, uh, as you'll see uh, every once in a while jury trials that are up there, and every once in a while you'll see that we lose a jury trial, and, and uh, we win probably as many as we lose, probably win more than, than, than what we lose. But the, the, probably 99% of the cases we file do not go to jury trial. They, people plea, and they get, a, it gets either some type of conviction or a deferred sentence. The cases that end up being tried are the tough cases, the cases where they think they've got a shot to win. They think there's, there's some evidence that they think that they can uh, get by with what's going on. And our burden in cases are beyond a reasonable doubt. It's not just what do you think happened, it's do you have any doubt at all that's reasonable that this person didn't do it. And that's, all, that's what we see in the courtroom is trying to create questions and doubts and things such as that. And so. We accept that, that should be, the, if you're gonna put someone in prison, that should be the burden of proof. We certainly will agree to that. Uh, it just makes it tough, and we, uh, our, our success rate is pretty good these days. So I uh, thank you all for the chance to talk to you all, and we'll be glad to answer any questions. Thank you. We do have just a few minutes. Are there any questions from the audience? And if we do, if I could ask all four of our guests to come up here, because depending on the question, one or more of you may want to propose an answer. So if you all would step up here, please. Okay, Lynn. Well, the county commitment. For the maintenance of the jail would be the jail trust authority is what I would say. And the, the courthouse we would the county commissioners would do the courthouse and the the other officers. So. In case you all don't know, the, when when the new jail was built, the sh jail was previous to that point was run by the sheriff's office. When they built the new jail, they set up a system where a jail trust authority was set up with citizens serving on that, and they meet on a monthly basis. There's fu funds that come from uh, uh, taxes that you all approved that pay for the jail and operation of the jail. Um, if you haven't been up to see the new jail, go up and see it. It's, it's beautiful, 
And when was the last time you saw a problem at the jail in, in the paper? You know, you, back when there were scapes and things like that, this jail is, is a wonderful jail. Um, I think all the things you mentioned are causes. Um, I think that um, we all just need to try to keep our kids close to us and talk to them about the problems of, of, of drugs. Um, I think it's a, I don't think people just start, um, I don't think people just start using drugs like meth. I think they start with probably alcohol and then advance to marijuana and then advance to, to methamphetamines. Um, they call marijuana the gateway drug. Um, I think legalizing marijuana would be the wrong option. Uh, we'll find out in a few years if the Colorado and Oregon and Washington uh, experiments work or not. Um, I'm doubtful. Every health agency I've seen don't, don't recommend that. Um, but the, uh, the way, I mean, unless, until they come up with some sort of drug <coughs> that will counteract meth, um, I think it's a, it's a problem we're dealing with because it's cheap. It's come, Mex Mexico it comes up from Mexico. It's, it's available anywhere. It's small, so it's easy to, uh, to hide uh, large amounts of it. And, uh, um, but I think education is, and, and family is everything. Uh, family is a way to, my kids I know, and again, I, I hope they never used any illegal drugs. I don't think they have, but they, they were real quick to must talk. We talked about drugs, and we talked about the use of drugs, and, and uh, I think that that's an important thing for all of us to do with our families. Christy, it's my understanding. It's my un it's my understanding that all funds from the state come into your office, and then you distribute the money to these people. Is that correct? Yes. So she's the. <laughs> Be nice to her, or you don't get your money. <laughs> right? Okay. Okay. Thank you. I'd like to ask you a question about this intersection <clears throat> north of Ponca City where 77 uh, turns to left. I think, is that okay, 11, and goes over to Blackwell? It seems like there's a fatal accident up there at least once a year. Uh, I, I remember reading about a year ago about an 80-year-old woman that drove through the intersection and her husband was killed, and I think just recently wasn't there a, another accident with a, a tractor-trailer truck? I know you've lowered the speed limit there down to 55, but that doesn't seem to have solved the problem. Have you looked at anything more drastic, maybe putting a four-way stop there? Or? It's the, we don't handle, that's the, it'll be the state department, not the, not county. Yeah, state high. Yeah, we can, but, I mean, there's no promises that they'll listen, so. I didn't hear much about the county employees. But I want to tell you, they're a big backbone to everything that goes on. And I deal more with probably Christie than anyone. When I go in there, it's customer service, top of the line. So I just wanted to mention that for some of those employees that we sometimes leave out. And that was a statement, not a question. <laughs> and, and we would all agree with you, Robert. Uh, we would all agree. You, we, we would we would be nowhere without the folks that come in and work so hard and are committed and are come early and stay late. And I, I agree with you, we are very blessed. Oh wait, one more question, all right. Last endorsement, I grew up in Kansas where Harry Truman was an evil man Turns out he was a county commissioner and he learned how to do things. He headed the Department of War Materiel during the Great War and he became president. Good training ground. <laughs> no.
Again, we really appreciate all four of you coming and taking time out of your schedule to come up here and so forth. Uh, we want to thank the city for allowing us the use of these chambers and the refreshments and so forth. I want to remind everybody that the Ponca Politics Forums are uh, the responsibility or part of the Ponca Politics Committee. Uh, that committee is welcome to anyone that's a chamber member. We meet the third Friday of every month. And we have a lot of things scheduled for next year they are going to be exciting. We're going to bring special speakers into each and every committee meeting. We will not have one in December due to the holidays, but we'll kick them off again January. And also I'd like to announce today that on January the 23rd we'll have our next Ponca Politics Forum. And that will include Secretary of Transportation Gary Ridley and Oklahoma Department of Transportation Director Mike Patterson. And so they'll be here to speak to the community and update us on a lot of exciting things. So uh, I'd like to also remind everybody that you can see this uh, forum on channel 22 beginning Monday at 10.30 a.m., 6.30 p.m., and 9.30 p.m. Or for those like Natalie who's techie, you can go to punkcityok.gov. Under the community videos, you can see it at any time and, and watch the forum. Again, we appreciate everybody coming. We certainly appreciate you, Christy, Tammy, Jason, and Brian for taking the time. And thank you again.